for example, you know that newspaper favourite, the number of people seen an accident and emergency within four hours. Should we not be saying that will change from four hours to six hours or seven hours and there's nothing the Scottish Government can do about it? Otherwise, we'll get the blame for it when it happens. I don't, this, these things seem projectable to me, but I don't see any discussion <coughs> of that. Um, well, I think the, the, the problem is you can see the absolute field day they would have if the four hours in A&E <laughs> was changed to six hours um, because they would they would just simply say, there you go, admission of failure, Scottish government have to move their target. So unfortunately, the issue of the media is, is one of the big issues that we still have because everything is through the lens of them. It's not so much that I would say that target should change. In actual fact, Scotland has performed uh, way ahead of every other country in the UK uh, since March 2015 on that target. But it's, it's more explaining what you're talking about, the background. We need to be talking to people about the nursing vacancy we have, about the EU doctors who are leaving, about the challenges. So it's not so much saying we no longer aspire to, to deal with people in four hours. It's actually explaining to people. And the problem with that is how to get that message out when you're, when you're talking through the lens of a media that is relentlessly anti-independence and anti-SMP. And that's a difficulty with no matter what we're trying to explain. I, d I didn't mean to pick that as the best example. No, no, sure. You could talk about the length of time before a cancer patient is seen or, or, or various other sure. things. Um, I understand what you're saying, although I don't think it answers our dilemma. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I don't think I've got an answer to the dilemma, but I do think that we have to explain to people the challenges we have. I mean, when I talk about the NHS in Westminster, I'm always very open about the fact we face the same challenges as the other three health services, that we have increased demand, we have an aging population, we have workforce shortages, and money is tight. What we don't have in Scotland is one high and tied behind our backs by the kind of privatisation agenda that they have in NHS England. But I'm, I never try to make out that it's all easy and airy-fairy. And I don't think anyone who works in the NHS at the moment would think that. But it's trying to have that, as you suggest, adult conversation with people about the pressures we're already under, because I think workforce is our biggest challenge, and how that will get worse with Brexit. And not just with Brexit, but also the whole home office, hostile environment approach to people who come from anywhere outside the UK. And I think it is important to have those discussions, but it is difficult. And that's why one-to-one -one is still so important, because the media can't stop you talking to your neighbours or your cousin or your mum, and those are the people that we have to actually speak to. I'd just like to uh, come back to a couple of points you made about the, um, clinical, the, cl the clinical trials and the, the potential to lose jobs and economic, economic activity. With it. We were right in saying that um, Scotland's going to lose out disproportionately to that due to our relative um, attractiveness, due to our, mm -hmm. our integrated patient management system. It makes us very, you know, very appealing for uh, these sorts of clinical trials. It's not just our, our kind of more integrated NHS. Um, we also have uh, an incredibly high ratio of university to head of population and indeed medical schools, five medical schools uh, for five million people. Um, is, is a very high density and we've got a really strong uh, reputation in research generally so if you look under Horizon 2020 the UK was a net major beneficiary they got the biggest amount of funding biggest amount of grants biggest amount of being the principal investigator within that Scotland punches way above its weight I mean almost kind of 40% uh, above our population rate for attracting these things. So in that sense, yes, we are going to be uh, more hit. Um, and, and again, in universities and in the academic world, you have significant EU populations. I mean, most universities, it's between 25 and 30% of their researchers are from the EU. And it is that ability to move around and that ability to collaborate. Um, and, you know, losing that, I mean, there, the EU is about or is in the process of launching a new clinical trials regulation system and database to actually make it quicker and easier to design new trials, to bring data together. There will be a single digital portal through which trials will be registered. And we're going to be outside all of that.
You know, this is the problem. It isn't just about things moving at the border. Things moving at the border is a challenge, but actually I think the biggest loss is the, is the loss of collaboration, whether it's in research or dealing with climate change or dealing with cyber terrorism. All of those things you can't do on your own, and, and I, that's my biggest fear. Could I just make one observation about uh, NHS differences between Scotland and England? When I was working in intensive care, the Scottish Intensive Care Society representing all the intensive care units in Scotland entered into a, a sort of comparison with a group called Southwest Thames, which was London down to Southampton and Portsmouth and you know that area of the country. Uh, and we did this comparison, and uh, although we say that these great centres of excellence in Scotland, there is nevertheless a relative uniformity of performance in terms of, for example, this was very careful, um, you know, with severity scoring, stratification, uh, outcome from intensive care. And in Scotland, there was really there were differences between units, but you're talking about perhaps 20% differences at maximum. In the southwest Thames, there were horrific changes, uh, differences. Some units were doing for the same condition, same diagnosis, same severity, you know, having a three times better outcome. Needless to say that, that, that this particular study hit the rocks because nobody wanted in that area of the country to publish it, and so it wasn't published. Well, I, I think you've, you've actually hit on one of the things that Scotland does particularly well. Uh, I mean, Scotland is very well known for things like epidemiology, which is the research of population illness and what causes it. And that goes back decades and decades. We also have, since devolution, done a lot of work around setting standards, comparing ourselves, auditing ourselves, and driving up quality uh, of care. There was a report last year by a think tank called the Nuffield Trust called Learning from Scotland's NHS. You won't have had all that much coverage. Um, and they picked out three particular things that were very strong in Scotland that they felt the other health services should learn from. One was our integration. So we got rid of trusts you know, back in 2004. Then we got rid of primary care trusts. And now we're tackling the much more thorny issue of integrating health and social care, which is much more difficult. And part of why it is difficult is because social care is delivered by lots of different companies. So it has the, the issues that are causing problems in the NHS in England. So our integration was something they felt other uh, health services should aspire to. The second one was the quality improvement. This started back in 1999 with a thing called the Clinical Standards Board, and I was involved in developing the breast cancer standards. And we meet every year, and our performance against our audit standards are put up in a PowerPoint, and we all debate, you know, what happened to you this year, and, oh, I, we're having this difficulty, or, well, we had that problem two years ago, but this is what we did, and we've driven up our performance. You can't, can't do that in a competitive system. You know, Debenhams and M NHS, uh, sorry, M and S don't get together and share good ideas on dragging in more customers. We can do it because we are one NHS in Scotland. They don't have that kind of audit happening in England at the moment. They're trying to recreate it, but that has got lost. And the third one is the Scottish Patient Safety Program. This is the first national patient safety program in the world. And it is completely across the country. It's not open to discussion. And it has reduced hospital standardized mortality by a quarter. And that's a quarter during the last 10 years when patients are older, we have more patients, we have more complex patients. And yet we've managed to reduce bed sores, to reduce sepsis, to reduce all sorts of complications that were making people either ill or dying. And that is something that Scotland is recognized for doing and simply isn't happening across the board in England at the moment. So that, that is absolutely one of the strengths. Because believe me, when you see your performance compared to everybody else, you very quickly start having discussions about how do we drive ours up. And if you looked at the breast cancer performance over the last 15 years, you would see people just improving year on year on year 
not being threatened to shut down, nothing to do with money, nobody gets any extra money if they meet the targets, but simply people taking a pride in the care they deliver. And once they see the quality of their care, actually trying to make that better. You're, you're saying about all the, the good things that go on in Scotland, but no one ever hears about it. All we hear about in the, the Scottish media is, oh, NHS, Scotland has done this badly, have done this badly, have done this badly. Nothing about comparison with England. What do we do about that? Well, well, what you will find is the people who are kind of anti-independence or anti-SNP go, oh, well, why are you only comparing yourself with England? You know, that's a pretty low bar. Um, you, you should be aiming much higher than that. Well, what I always point out when I'm doing comparisons, because obviously that's often the space that I'm in in, in in Westminster, is we have three health services in Great Britain run by three major parties, SNP, Tories in England, Labour in Wales. Hashtag go compare. And if you look at things like the four-hour target that was mentioned, Scotland achieves that approximately 9 or 10% more uh, than England does. You know, Labour talk about how they would transform everything in Scotland. Well, have a wee look at how they're doing in Wales. It's not terribly brilliant. And the commonest phrase that I hear if in Westminster, where obviously I spend a lot of my time in meetings with UK-wide charities that are health-related, is the common phrase is, you're so lucky in Scotland. And yet you come over the border, you open the Herald, you open the Record, you open the Scotsman, and it's absolutely full of NHS Scotland in crisis. Now, part of that is because that is one of the, the stories that exists on the NHS. There only are kind of about three stories. NHS in crisis, doctor or nurse did bad stuff, or miracle cure. Everything else is boring. NHS struggling along, treating, you know, uh, one and a half million people a year and managing pretty well, thank you, if not perfectly, just isn't a story. They've never been interested in that. And the problem is, at the moment, they're even less interested in that, in, in talking about the fact of what we're managing to do, the things we are driving forward, the quality we are driving up, the better outcomes we have now in comparison to when I was a young surgeon that just isn't a story they're ever going to report. Thank you very much for your talk. It's been tremendous. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. However, your uh, mention of rallies and things like that that are uh, been happening throughout Scotland with AOU, AUOB and so on through the summer leads me to my point. So you've been spared any medical stuff. <laughs> this, Sunday, this Saturday we're having the Edinburgh rally uh, with all its complications that we all know about. However, AUOB need people, all of you, to help us with this rally by stewarding or whatever they would like you to do. Please turn up at uh, Johnson Terrace, 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, and you'll get your instruction. I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Is that the equivalent of photobombing? <laughs> Uh, Peter wanted to say a word yeah. as well. Sorry, NHS, purely I was not back to worry at the earlier bones. And since I have two people with specialised knowledge of the NHS, I'd go to the barricades for the NHS before I'd go to the barricades for the SNP, because I owe my life three times to the Scottish NHS. But recent events have shown that there's still a legacy in the NHS of a hierarchical culture, a culture of bullying, a culture that can suppress incompetence of individuals for a long time. How can that be addressed? Um, well, I think, I mean, I think bullying is, is an issue in all sorts of walks of life. And I can tell you what, Ian talked about how hard it was to be a surgeon, uh, but it was actually also particularly to be a woman surgeon. When I started, there were no women surgeons in Scotland at all. I was told at medical school I couldn't be a surgeon because I was a woman. I was always that woman for the first half of my career. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the kind of bullying that happens. And I think that this, the way that you tackle that is, is something that we need to be doing much more at medical school. We need to be teaching doctors about how to interact with each other, about how to work in teams, because that's a personal skill. 
that leads to bullying. And frankly, the worst bullies I've ever dealt with are people who are insecure. People who